This is my first video update coming to you from Nicosia, Cyprus on this Thursday, Thursday morning. <laughs> I lost track of the, uh, of the days. Yeah, it's a, it's a Thursday. So let's talk about uh, some news and uh, real quick, let's do an update as to what's going on in Serbia. We had uh, the news yesterday evening that uh, Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic, he has uh, told the, the, uh, the protesters who set up the barricades in uh, Kosovo, in northern Kosovo, to remove those barricades, those roadblocks, and uh, they are doing that. And it looks like the, the tensions in Kosovo for the time being will uh, will come down now, and so the uh, the threat of some sort of conflict for the time being between NATO and Serbia has uh, has been averted. Now Vucic told the uh, the Serbs in uh, in Kosovo that. He has received guarantees from the European Union, the US, the NATO K4 forces. They have received guarantees that uh, once those barricades are removed, once they come down, the uh, Pristina security forces are, uh, are not going to, to make any arrests or anything like that. So. Um, Supposedly, he's gotten the guarantees that the people in northern Kosovo will be safe from the Pristina authorities. The EU and the U.S. have, and the U.S. gave written guarantees that participants in the peaceful protests against Kurti's terror will not be arrested. Goran Rakic, a local Serb political leader, told Serbian TV channel Pink. Uh, moreover, NATO's peacekeeping force, K4, also issued new guarantees that Kosovo security forces won't, won't be deployed to the Serb majority counties in the north of the province, he said. So, look, we got an off-ramp. At the end of the day, uh, conflict was averted because an off-ramp was provided. Did, uh, did Vucic kind of blink in in all of this uh this escalation this tension mm. kind of kind of but look he got written guarantees not that you can trust <laughs> the written guarantees coming out of the collective west but in this instance i think uh those guarantees will hold will hold true for a while for a short-term period i think they'll uh They'll abide by those guarantees. So he got, he got an off ramp. Vucic got his off ramp. He loses maybe a little face, maybe, but uh, nothing that's going to, to damage. In my opinion, I don't think it's going to damage his political uh, career. He lost a little bit of political capital, just a touch. And uh, and the EU, well, they averted a disaster as well. So. They also blinked. They provided these guarantees, NATO, the EU, they provided guarantees to Serbia, and uh, they averted a conflict that would have hurt them as well. Uh, we did a video on this on the Duran a couple of days ago, and we noted that, uh, yes, yeah, Serbia is in a tough position, but you know, the European Union, NATO, they're, uh, they're not in such a good position to, uh, to have a conflict in the Balkans either. NATO has been weakened. It's, uh, it's been demilitarized. Many countries in the European Union demilitarized. Economies are crumbling. And a lot of the, the EU member states in and around uh, Serbia, well, politically, they would not be uh, in a good position to handle some sort of conflict in, uh, in the Balkans. Uh, Greece and Bulgaria, uh, Montenegro, North Macedonia, all, all of these countries would, uh, would not benefit 
from uh, a conflict in the Balkans. So the EU and NATO, they were not in the best position either for some sort of, uh, of conflict to break out. So at the end of the day, everyone kind of got their off ramp and uh, a disaster for the time being has been uh, averted for the time being. Uh, nothing's really been solved, to be quite honest. But uh, we've, we've gotten a, a bit of a, a delay from, uh, from this uh, incident, from these tensions. Anyway, that is the update with regards to uh, Serbia, Kosovo, Metohija. Let's, uh, let's now talk about another big story kind of breaking news from yesterday, and that is uh, that Elensky, Belensky, <laughs> Belensky has announced that he is planning to join the, uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos. And according to the Post Millennial, Belensky is going to, to sign big, big contracts with uh, BlackRock. <laughs> so this is the big one. This is the big meeting, the big Davos WEF meeting with Klaus Schwab and uh, Belensky will be headlining this event and he will be joined by uh, Larry Fink of BlackRock and they are going to, to be signing all kinds of uh, Ukraine reconstruction deals and investment funds and fundraising all kinds of stuff they're going to uh to be working on and uh we're not sure whether uh belensky will appear in person or virtually but uh, they've been cooking up this uh this deal for quite a while this block rock wef Ukraine re reconstruction uh, deal has been in the making since uh, September, actually. And uh, I am going to post Millennial's website. They are citing sources from Bloomberg, which uh, said that to an address to the nation, Belensky noted that specialists of BlackRock, of this company, are already helping Ukraine to structure the fund for the reconstruction of our state. That is according to Bloomberg and according to a Wednesday post on the president's official website, Belensky said, and I quote, in accordance with the preliminary agreements struck earlier this year between the head of state, Belensky and Larry Fink, the BlackRock team has been working for several months on a project to advise the Ukrainian government on how to structure the country's reconstruction funds. Belensky and Larry Fink agreed to focus in the near term on coordinating the efforts of all potential investors and participants in the reconstruction of our country, channeling investment into the most relevant and impactful sectors of the Ukrainian economy, the Post added. During the conversation, it was emphasized that certain BlackRock leaders plan to visit Ukraine in the new year <laughs> oh project ukraine <laughs> man project ukraine there is just a lot of money in project ukraine <laughs> wow so yeah blackrock is getting in on some of the uh the reconstruction uh plans for ukraine what did uh what did Vander Crazy say about six months back? What did she promise? Oh yeah, she promised that the EU would absolutely pick up the bill for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> and what's that bill? Five hundred billion, seven hundred billion, according to Belensky. One trillion. Man, oh man. What to say, what to say. So, uh, yeah, that is, uh, that is the latest news coming out of the WEF, Klaus Schwab and Belensky and BlackRock. What a trinity that is, huh? So, uh, yeah, uh, you know that there's a lot of money to be made when BlackRock is, 
is getting involved in what's about to take place. And so here's what's going to go down. The reconstruction is like the actual physical reconstruction is secondary. What's important now is raising all the money, putting all the money together. That's what matters. And that's what BlackRock is going to manage. Getting all those hundreds of billions in place. Whether they actually reconstruct or build something, that's, that's a different story. I don't think that's too, uh, too important for, for Fink, for uh, Schwab, for uh, Belensky. None of that really matters. What matters now is, uh, is building up this massive reconstruction fund and managing this massive reconstruction fund, controlling this money. That's what they're going to be working on, and that's the deal that they're going to sign. That's what they're putting together. So, um, yeah, uh, anyone that's questioning uh, if you're on the, on the right or wrong side of history, well, Schwab, WEF, BlackRock, and, uh, and Belensky, this is... This is uh, neoliberal globalism at its absolute pinnacle, at its peak. This is it. So, nothing more to say about that. Um, I'm sure that when Belensky talked about one trillion in reconstruction, and uh, the EU talked about 700 billion in reconstruction, I'm sure that BlackRock, uh, Larry Fink's ears perked up and he said, wow, now that, that is juicy. <laughs> we got to get in on that. And uh, here we are. So big deals are going to be signed in Davos. Let's... Uh, <laughs> incredible. Absolutely incredible. So um, let's do another update, actually, on, uh, on a story that I talked about a couple of days ago, and that has to do with the peace summit that was floated by Ukraine's uh, foreign minister, Kaluba. The peace summit where the UN would be mediating and Russia would not be invited to this uh, Ukraine peace summit until there was some sort of tribunal and prosecution of Kremlin officials for alleged war, cri war crimes. And only after this tribunal would Russia then be invited to this UN mediated and brokered peace summit and the date for this peace summit according to the foreign ministry of ukraine is slated for february 24th in order to mark the one year anniversary of uh of the conflict anyway we have an update with regards to this peace summit that is the idea that was floated out by the ukraine foreign ministry a peace summit without uh russia represented without russia having a seat at the table and the response that we have from the Russian side, and it comes from the first deputy permanent representative to the United Nations, Dmitry Polyansky, is quite clever. Mr. Polyansky said that it is not difficult to imagine such an event taking place without Ukraine. <laughs> A very clever comment from uh, the UN representative, because what is Polyansky saying? He is basically saying, look, uh, Russia absolutely should be uh, seated at the table if there was such an event to take place. Let's just say that this peace summit actually gets the green light. Russia should be at the table because Russia can actually negotiate and can make decisions. It has the power to make and enforce decisions, and it has the power to, uh, to negotiate but uh, Ukraine, well, if there's one country that really isn't needed at the negotiating table, it's Ukraine because everyone knows that Ukraine isn't really calling the shots. It doesn't have the power to, uh, to negotiate and to enforce any decisions that are made. It doesn't have that power. But the country that should be seated at the table, if uh, there was to be some sort of peace summit negotiation, well, that would be the uh, United States because the United States actually does have the power to make decisions and to negotiate and to enforce those decisions if it wanted to. 
So that's the point that Poliansky's making, a very clever point, and uh, I thought I would update everybody on that. We also have um, breaking news. We had breaking news from yesterday that uh, the defense ministers of um, Russia, Turkey, and Syria, they held a high-level meeting yesterday in uh, preparation of what could be a potential summit. Peace talks, like real peace talks between um, Erdogan and Assad, a rapprochement between Erdogan and Assad. And this is huge news. If, uh, if this does happen, it, is, it effectively means what would be the, uh, the end of, uh, of a very long conflict in Syria, a very long regime change operation in Syria. And it looks like we are heading towards that, uh, that meeting between Erdogan and Assad. It would be a huge win for Russian diplomacy. Um, it would be a huge win for, uh, for the region, for Syria, for Assad. And I just want to say one thing about Syria and Assad. Syria was the country where color revolutions and regime change died. It was the country that actually put an end to regime change operations. It was one of the first, if not the first, unsuccessful failed regime change operation uh, launched by the, uh, by the neocons. That happened in Syria. So I think it's an important, uh, important thing to remember that it was the, uh, the Syrian people that were actually the first people. At least I can't think of another country, but um, in my mind, it was the Syrian people that actually stood up to, uh, to the regime change and uh, did not allow regime change to happen in their country. And uh, the collective West, they've been upset with Syria, with Putin, with Russia. They've been very, very mad, the neocons, very mad at the fact that, uh, that Iran, that Syria, Assad, and that Russia put an end to their uh, color revolution, regime change, winning streak, if you want to call it that. They had, they had a streak of regime changes going on from the, from the 90s to the early 2000s, and it was Syria that broke that, uh, that streak. So um, we're coming to the end of a very, uh, very tragic but important, um, important timeline, important event. And uh, I think we're going to get there. I think Russia is going to get Assad and Erdogan together in the same room for what would be uh, a huge, uh, a huge meeting. So uh, let's talk about another meeting which took place a couple of days ago, and that is the meeting between Erdogan and, uh, not between Erdogan, <laughs> what am I saying? That is the meeting between Lukashenko and Putin. <laughs> and, uh, and they met for the second time in, in, I think, like a week, a week and a half. They've met uh, for a second time, this time in uh, St. Petersburg at the Russian Museum and a very interesting location that uh, the Kremlin picked out. Now, Lukashenko said that uh, during the meeting, uh, Russia and Belarus, they, uh, they solidified um, the, the agreements of, uh, of, of what is becoming a type of union, union states, a very tight integration on all levels between Russia and Belarus. Lukashenko said they dotted a lot of I's during the meeting in uh, St. Petersburg at the uh, Russian Museum. Putin said this, and let me pull it up here, and this has to tie in to the location of the actual uh, meeting, because you will notice, I will put uh, a video, a screenshots and a video uh, right now. Um, for everyone to see, you will notice that it is Putin and Lukashenko. They're sitting in a room at the Russian Museum. And, uh, and behind them, you will notice 
some very uh, famous art. Basically, it is the room with uh, pictures from uh, Russian artist Alexander Ivanov. Very famous uh, paintings from Ivanov. And Putin said this, he said, in such an informal setting, we will continue our communication in such wonderful interiors. We have agreed that 2023 will be celebrated as the year of the Russian language. It seems to me that meeting today for a working breakfast at the Russian Museum would be most appropriate. This is a good environment for us to talk about serious business. So, um, one of the paintings, the big painting behind uh, Putin Lukashenko is a painting from Ivanov called uh, The Appearance of Christ to the People. And this is considered to be Ivanov's um, masterpiece. He actually worked on this painting for 20 years and he painted 300 uh, sketches and preparatory uh, works to get to the final uh, masterpiece of, uh, of the appearance of Christ to the people. And the actual masterpiece, which is a massive painting, I mean, much bigger than the picture you see in this, uh, the painting you see in this, uh, in this photograph, in, in the video, is actually in the Tretakov Gallery in Moscow. So what you're seeing in the Russian Museum where uh, Putin and Lukashenko are sitting. I believe this is one of Ivanov's um, preparatory uh, paintings before he actually got to the final massive, massive um, masterpiece that hangs at the Tretakov. But either way, the room, the room is full of paintings from, uh, from Ivanov. Uh, one of, the, one of the, uh, the, the biggest, if not the biggest collection of, uh, of Ivanov paintings is in the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg. And why do I bring all of this up? Because um, the fact that Putin chose the Russian Museum in this specific room to hold a meeting with Lukashenko, I believe, signifies that Russia is, uh, is absolutely uh, breaking away from the, the neoliberal globalist uh, West the neoliberal globalist world order. It's basically Putin and Lukashenko, two, um, two countries in, in the Ruski Mir, in the Russian world, sitting down together in this room by, by one of the great Russian painters surrounded by beautiful uh, classic Russian art. Um, much of this art uh, religious or orthodox in nature. It's, it's these leaders sitting down in this room at the Russian Museum saying, you know what? We reject the, uh, the dogma, the ideology of the collective West. And what we're looking at is we're looking at, at, um, at a return to, to the Russian culture, Russian history, Russian art, Russian language, instead of tearing down our history, instead of trying to erase our history and cancel our artists, we're here in this museum surrounded by Ivanov uh, paintings to say that we honor our culture, our history, our great artists. It's, it's the exact opposite of, uh, of what you see coming out of the Collective West, which is WEF, Davos, Schwab, Belensky, cancel culture, the tearing down of, uh, of statues, the removal of statues, the, uh, the raising of, uh, of a Ukrainian flag in, in the US Congress, you know, think of the symbolism there, the fact that Pelosi and Harris actually, you know, raised a flag from another country in, uh, in the house of the people. You know, Russia is rejecting all of that. They're rejecting all of that. And uh, that's, that's the symbolism of, uh, of this location for this meeting between Putin and Lukashenko. Putin does this a lot, actually. He he chooses certain locations when he has really important meetings and, uh, 
And you have to keep an eye out for some of the symbolism in those locations, especially with regards to uh, art or statues and things like this. I remember in 2000, I think it was 2018, in, uh, during a time when the, uh, when uh, Erdogan shot, shot down the, uh, the Russian fighter jet, and we almost had a conflict between Turkey and Russia. Anyway, what, uh, what Russia did is they pretty much cut off business ties with, uh, with Turkey. And it really hurt the Turkish economy, especially the, uh, the tourist industry. And so um, Erdogan wanted to, to reconcile with Putin. And so he finally got a meeting with Putin, went up to, uh, to Moscow, and, uh, and as he was waiting to meet with Putin so they could reconcile after this, uh, this event, this shooting down of the, of the Russian fighter jet, uh, Putin had Erdogan waiting in a room for like a couple of hours, and in that room there was a statue, like right in back of Erdogan, of uh, Catherine the Great. And... Uh, and her victory over the uh, the Ottoman Turks, and he had Erdogan sitting in that room for a couple of hours with that. It was a small statue, but it was like you know, right right behind Erdogan, and he had Erdogan sitting there with that statue there, and uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of people were talking about this. Maybe it was coincidence. Maybe you know, it just happened to to be there, but. I think Putin, he's, he, uh, he picks his spots. Sometimes he picks his spots very carefully. And there's a lot of symbolism in the locations where he, uh, where he has meetings. So anyway, I thought I would point that out because not many people are, uh, are talking about the Lukashenko-Putin meeting, which is important because this is their second meeting in, in like a week and a half. So... Russia and Belarus are uh, getting very, very close together. They are, they are moving very close together. And uh, since we are talking about Catherine the Great, let's do a clown world and discuss uh, Catherine the Great and uh, the city that she, uh, that she founded, which was Odessa. And we have reports now that the Odessa authorities, they are now starting to physically remove the famous statue of Catherine the Great in Odessa. And, uh, and actually a lot of statues throughout Ukraine are starting to get taken down. Any statues which, which, uh, which are connected to, to the history of Ukraine, much of that history, if not all of that history is is connected to to uh, Russia, so statues of uh, of Gorky were taken down in Dnieper the other day, and um, I'm getting reports of other statues that are being removed throughout uh, Ukraine, and uh, the big one is the statue of Catherine the Great, which is now physically being taken down. There are like photos of of the workers actually taking down the statue of Catherine the Great. And it is going to be placed, once they physically take it down, it will be placed in some sort of, of statue warehouse or something like that. And this is the very person, the Empress, the Tsarina, that, uh, that actually, this is her city. I mean, there would be no Odessa if there was no Catherine the Great. Whatever you may think of Catherine the Great as a ruler, this is the city that she uh, that she loved, and uh, and the authorities in Odessa are removing her statue. It was uh, it was decided by like a Facebook post. I remember I talked about this story a couple of months back. They did like a Facebook poll, not a post, a poll on Facebook, and uh, the votes came in favor of removal of this statue. So the authorities in Odessa said, well. The Facebook poll, the Facebook vote says that we should remove the statue, so we're going to remove it <laughs> from a Facebook poll. A Facebook poll is going to decide the, 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 the history, the architecture of Odessa 
clown freaking world. Talk about removing your very history, removing the very, the very person that, uh, that you owe your entire city to is, <laughs> is, you know, what can you say? What can you say? Anyway, that is the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. Look for us on Rockfin as well and go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. Take care.